All right, well, I, I wanted to thank you all for coming uh, for Matthew Weiss and uh, where stories come from. Uh, I'm Nathan Fox. I'm chair of the MFA Visual Narrative uh, Program here at the School of Visual Arts. Thank you. Uh, some students are here. Uh, if anybody would like to accost them and ask them about the program. Um, so without further delay, I guess I would kind of like to introduce uh, the man at the hour a little bit. Um, I had the opportunity of meeting uh, Matthew uh, uh, on a few occasions, uh, and definitely uh, to my amazement and joy. Uh, I think our first conversation, our first real heady conversation, uh, involved Star Trek, gaming, comics, uh, why Superman mattered, I think. I think you were arguing that against my opposing force. And, uh, and we, I think we, we hit it off rather well. And I'm really excited to have him here, uh, as well as fu future engagements for the program, uh, but more that, about that in the future. Uh, and uh, to have him here tonight uh, to talk about where uh, stories come from. Uh, so to give you a little bit of a background, uh, he's a game designer uh, and writer whose work spans industry as well as academia. Uh, he has been a narrative, des narrative designer at Harmonix Music System on Fantasia, uh, Music Evolved, uh, the game design director of the Gambit Game Lab at MIT, uh, and a consultant for Microsoft, PBS, uh, and other transmedia storytelling uh, and game design, just to name a few. So without further delay, please welcome Matthew Weiss. Thanks. OK. Um, Everybody can hear me, uh, and I guess this is for the room, they say. Um, I don't know. Well, we'll see if I need this. OK, uh, I'm here to talk about where stories come from, as I'm sure you know from the title. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll just jump right into it. So uh, a little bit about me. Um, I did work uh, at MIT for many years. Uh, I worked on experimental storytelling at MIT. Uh, I worked for Harmonix Music Systems, which, as you know, did uh, rock band Guitar Hero. Um, I was the first person who was hired at that company as what we call in video games a narrative designer, which is a designer who also can be a writer, in this case I was, but it's mainly a, a designer whose job it is to make sure that the experience of the story comes across to the player. Um, I did an experimental game at MIT called the experimental narrative game called The Snowfield, which was nominated for the Independent Games Festival. Uh, which was a charming game about freezing to death during the First World War that was <laughs> highly emotional and very dramatic, and you can actually play it for free online. Um, and then um, Clara Fernandez, who's here, and I uh, worked on Transcendence Origins, which is a prequel to the Johnny Depp movie that came out a few years ago for Warner Brothers, um, in which Johnny Depp's brain takes over the internet and becomes the internet. So. <laughs> Uh, it's a movie to check out. Also, uh, I originally, even though I'm a practitioner, I come from media studies, so I'm very interested, uh, as you'll soon find out, in uh, you know, kind of an archaeology of ideas, uh, where, uh, where all these things we want to tell stories about come from, um, how different uh, myths, characters, and archetype uh, come together. Uh, and I've done some writing about that, uh, mostly in the vein of how they have been transferred to video games. So for example, I did, uh, wrote a chapter for this book on James Bond in video games. Uh, and also, I've written quite a lot about uh, horror video games, how characters and tropes from horror have been adapted to interactive systems. Uh, and uh, now, uh, Claire and I have a company called Fiction Control, and we do uh, immersive storytelling in uh, games, uh, in different kinds of digital entertainment, and we're working on our first big narrative independent project. So, uh, being a talk about storytelling, I would like to get started with a story, uh, surprise, surprise, uh, about uh, a situation I was in one time uh, that I think illustrates the core of why I want to give this talk. So, one time I was working on a project, uh, and I'll leave the details vague, but uh, I was working on a project in which we were, uh, it was me uh, and a bunch of artists, and we were trying to figure out uh, you know, what we wanted our game level to be and what ideas we wanted to engage with in the level and, and engage the player in. And we were thinking of different inspirations for that. And people were thinking of different myths and legends, you know, the kind of stuff you see in video games all the time. And at one point, uh, one of us brought up uh, the idea of uh, the golem, right, which is this uh, mythological concept of this kind of clay figure that comes to life. It's originally a Hebrew uh, folklore uh, kind of character. 
And um, it was funny because there were many people on the project who were kind of with me. They were like, oh yeah, that's really interesting. There's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot of ideas that you could be inspired by. But uh, there, was, there, was, there was one person who was like, oh, um, I actually don't want to be influenced by anything uh, because uh, I just want to not think about what I'm doing so I can you know, be original. And, uh, and, uh, and besides, those things were done in World of Warcraft, and I don't want to do World of Warcraft because that's what golems are. They're those things in World of Warcraft, which is what that is. And um, it was one of these things where I was just like, okay, that is, I think you, you, you have achieved, you have managed to understand creativity perfectly backwards, right? Like, so uh, this is actually the opposite of how it works. So um, what's interesting is that I think me and some of the other people on the team, um, this is what we think of when we think of the golem. We think of like the rich history um, and all the different ways that it's appeared in different, cult uh, different cultures and different contexts and the way that it's been adapted to for example, science fiction, among other things, like also in cyberpunk, right? But it's this huge, complicated world. Like it can mean, it can, it can mean, it can be a, a springboard to find ideas uh, that you never would have thought of otherwise as being connected, right? Like the idea of ancient alchemy uh, and animation with the idea of uh, computers, right? Which is where AI comes from, or where where AI and science fiction, in a lot of cases, comes from. So I mean, you know, this person was thinking of World of Warcraft and me and some other people were thinking of Blade Runner, Battlestar Galactica, Ghost in the Shell, right? Like all these kind of like rich possibilities that you can get from the idea of bringing inanimate uh, material to life as kind of a base concept. Um, so the point here is that, you know, there is this false idea that I think we get stuck in when we are creators and we're trying to figure out, you know, how do I, there's this whole world of ideas, how do I jump in and, and actually contribute something that's interesting or that means something? Um, but I don't want to be influenced, so I'm not going to think about it. And that, that, I mean, I understand why people do that, because it's scary. It's huge, right? I mean, just look, look at all the media out there. Look at all the art out there. Um, and um, we're all influenced. We all belong to a culture, and our culture, cultures that we belong to, different, different cultures for different people in different ways, all contribute to the way we understand stories and the way we tell stories instinctively. Um, so that's what this is about. This is a talk about how we can better understand how culture influences us and our storytelling, and what that means as creators as we have a better grasp of that. Um, so I'm going to begin with what you probably have heard of. Uh, and uh, you know, this is pretty basic stuff. Uh, while I wouldn't quite say this is an anti-hero's journey talk, um, I do want to kind of demystify the hero's journey. I want to present it as something that has been um, overemphasized and uh, overprescribed, as it were, uh, as a tool to become a storyteller or to tell stories or to find what's interesting about stories. Um, the, for those of you who don't know, uh, Joseph Campbell, the monomyth, it became a popular concept because of Star Wars and George Lucas. George Lucas famously has attributed a lot of his thinking about Star Wars to uh, Joseph Campbell's idea of the monomyth, and, which is basically the idea that, if you, um, that there are many cultures around the world and they all kind of have different myths and legends and characters and stories about heroes who go on journeys, but if you look at them, you can kind of find all these similarities and go, oh, I get it, they're all really the same. Um, that's a bit of a simplification, but in a lot of ways, that's been the takeaway from our culture when it comes to storytelling. And I think especially because it's been kind of filtered through George Lucas kind of into Hollywood and then back into culture, it's been this thing that has become a formula, right? We think of it like a formula as like, oh, I understand stories because I saw that chart, right? Um, and now I get it, so we're done. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, this, is a, this is a funny way to like understand it. Um, and I have to thank Clara for actually pointing this out to me. It was a very, it's very cool, which is, uh, you know, as you can see, you can just kind of take words and replace them and, you know, you accurately kind of have uh, a different story with the same character, right? So, uh, you know, these famous characters from fiction who go through these same kind of trials, right? So, I mean, obviously going back to Greek mythology, like Perseus, there's like Frodo, Luke Skywalker, Neo in the Matrix also follows this, of course. Harry Potter, incredibly obviously. Every character who's the protagonist of like any RPG, uh, any JRPG like Final Fantasy, Cloud from Final Fantasy VII. Um, and uh, now, interestingly, um, and with a, with, a, with a kind of like self-conscious twist in terms of what it means in the broader culture, characters like Rey, or maybe not Furiosa with the hero's journey so much in from Fury Road, but anyway, I'll get to that later in the talk, but there's some interesting things happening. Um, and just to give you a very brief primer on it, right, this is the whole idea. It's like there's a call to adventure, there are, you know, you meet the mentor at some point, 
um, you know, you get this kind of like magical object that helps you through. It's, it's a wand, it's a lightsaber, it's a ring, you know, so. Um, I mean, I think most of us have kind of heard of this before, this whole idea. I think that in popular culture when we think like, oh, a, a bunch of smart people read about stories and figured it out, and now we know how stories work, like this is what they think of. It's like, this is the equation. This is like E equals MC squared of stories, you know, and that's obviously not the case. Um, so what is the case? Um, so I don't want to say that the hero's journey is wrong n necessarily, but I do think, like I was saying, that it's kind of like overemphasized, and I do think that People like um, Tolkien, for example, right, who's a famous as a, pure, uh, as, a, as a practitioner of this kind of storytelling has said that, yeah, and I, I'm trying to remember the exact quote, but it's something like, you know, when you, when, you when you kind of find these patterns and systems and formulas, they explain why a story is a story, but they don't explain why a good story is a good story, right? And those of you who are familiar with the original Star Wars movies and the prequel Star Wars movies can see, yeah, I mean, they actually follow the same formula, but there's like a lot to be said for like quality of dialogue and acting and how they affect how these things come across. Um, and another way of looking at it is to think that, uh, you know, where we become obsessed with the, the structure, the vessel for the storytelling, not the actual content of the story itself. Um, we confuse plot with story, and plot is more like the evidence of, a, of character conflict and context all functioning together. Um, I would say plot is the chalk outline, not the body, right? So, um, so what is the actual body, right? I think that it is uh, the particularities of different cultures and everyday lived experience of people uh, in different moments in history and how they experience their own lives and how they translate that into fiction. So there is something about the cultural specificity of different stories that actually make them universal because we're drawn into the specificity of a story because it's actually interesting and something we might not know. Uh, but then we discover things about ourselves by watching something that's the same but it's also different. So here we go. Uh, we're going to use, even though this is not a talk necessarily about America, uh, I'm going to use America and American myth as a case study to talk about storytelling in general. Uh, mainly just because, uh, I mean, I'm American, I come from that background, I mean, we're in America, it's something that I, I feel fairly, you know, it's okay to kind of make, uh, you know, claims about. Um, but also people who are uh, uh, immigrants and from other countries are also in this context and kind of also see it in their own way. Like, uh, in some ways they see it more clearly than uh, people who are, are born into the culture because they're coming to it from the outside. Um, so anyway, uh, we hear a lot about cross-cultural myths. We hear a lot about how characters from different cultures are really the same, not about how they're different, right? And in some very general ways, they're the same, but the ways in which they're different are actually very interesting. And we get stuck on this general level of the monomyth that we kind of never dig down and talk about uh, specific cultural myths and specific cultural archetypes. It's not just about the hero and the mentor. Um, it's about these particular American cultural myths that I'm going to talk about. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to get to the last one. You'll have to talk to me about uh, you know, future engagements uh, here, perhaps, to learn more about that. But we're going to go through the first three today, hopefully the first three. May have only time for the first two, but hopefully we'll get through all of them. Um, but I call them the superhero, embodied by Superman there, um, the vigilante, which is embodied by uh, Dirty Harry, Clint Eastwood is Dirty Harry, and then uh, the final girl, which is a little bit more of a modern one, uh, embodied by Jamie Lee Curtis from Halloween, um, and then uh, the team which uh, is really the kind of multicultural team that has to get through all their differences in order to achieve a mission, which is everything from like Inglorious Bastards to Star Trek. And uh, we're not gonna be talking about that one though, so that'll be for later. Um, and I just wanna say before I get into this that of course uh, it's not like these, these ideas and a lot of the stuff I'm about to talk about, it's not that these things literally don't exist in other, cult other cultures. For example, a lot of cultures have now borrowed them because they were proliferated so extremely in American media and then globally through uh, the American media system. But also, you know, they are originally, even before that, they are connected with different kind of cultures, different other cultures, and some of them have slightly different meaning in different cultures, and I'll try to mention that when I see that. You know, I don't want to be overly simplified here because everything is kind of touching everything else. There's not neat separations, but for the sake of the discussion, it's interesting to separate them in order to look at them temporarily. So. Okay, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the superhero as a kind of historical mystery, right? We're gonna talk about this in terms of, if we, were to, if we were to ask ourselves where Superman comes from, 
what would the answer be, right? What, what is Superman's origin story? I mean, we all know this. He is a baby on this other planet that is highly advanced, and his parents put him on this rocket ship and they send him to Earth. And on Earth, he has these magical superpowers. Um, everybody knows this. Anybody who's like even remotely familiar with Superman knows. I never read a Superman comic growing up. Like, I, my Superman was the movie Superman, like Christopher Reeve. And, you know, I knew this from, from that. So there's something about this character that is ingrained at such a deep cultural level that even people who are not really even that familiar with the character probably know this. Um, so there's been a lot said about Superman that, you know, when people usually want to say, why is he a great American character? They're like, well, he's an immigrant, and we're a nation of immigrants, and he's the greatest immigrant, and blah, blah, you know. And, uh, you know, that's kind of like the, the kind of the fun, happy, kind of like very optimistic, yeah, oh, yeah, that's great. You know, it's a celebration of being an immigrant. Um, and um, that's true. That is definitely true. Um, but it kind of doesn't stop there. That's kind of where it begins. So what I want to do is I want to pull back the layers of that historically and find some of the stuff lurking underneath. First, um, we go back to Edgar Rice Burroughs, um, who wrote Princess of Mars, and as you can see from this advertisement on the cover, Tarzan. So what is the story of Princess of Mars? Who is John Carter, and where do his powers come from? He comes from Earth. It's a reverse of Superman, right? He comes from Earth, goes to Mars, and just being there gives him his superpowers. So in a way, Superman is like a revision. It's like a revision kind of inversion of this character idea, which is in turn taken by the same writer from the Tarzan idea, right? This idea that um, you take a person from a quote unquote civilized place, you put him in a quote unquote savage place, and he gains this kind of incredible power. Uh, power that's more powerful than the savage place, the quote unquote savage place, and the civilized place. Um, so that idea of the hybrid being this figure, this kind of cross-cultural, in most cases, kind of a multiracial hybrid, um, becomes this uh, location of all this power that becomes unlocked. And really all Superman is doing is taking this idea and saying, oh, what if, what if Earth was the wilderness, as it were? Or what if Earth was the alien place and the person from this other culture was coming here? Um, so anyway. Uh, where does all this come from? Like, why did these ideas emerge in America at the particular time they did in the early 20th century? Um, and why did it have to be here, I think is the question I want to ask. So um, to answer that, I'm going to get some help from some very heavy books. Uh, there's a guy, Richard Slotkin, who is a, a historian, also a novelist. He spent basically his entire career researching the mythology of American heroes, starting, and it's a, it's a media history. He starts with the very beginning of the very first published writing and media in, on this continent by white Europeans who were trying to understand their own experience here through, uh, essentially through religion, right? Puritan sermons were the first things that were actually published by the Puritans who landed uh, in New England. And um, they were, uh, they proliferated out to the rest of the, uh, of the continent. And it's interesting how, even though not everyone who landed here were Puritans, in some ways the Puritan idea had a strong influence on the rest of the culture because they, had, they controlled the kind of major media center. Like their mythology, in a way, was disseminated more than a lot of other places. So anyway, um, Slotkin writes, a lot about this, and he kind of asks how we get from the original Puritans to Jack Bauer, say, you know, like how did it, how how do we get from them to you know Rambo or like our current heroes, right? So um, this is a fascinating project. Each one of these books is like over a thousand pages. Um, I'm going to give you the short version. So um, it basically boils down to, um, you know, uh, talking about uh, you know the uh, Puritans coming here and um, basically just being scared to death of the wilderness and really not knowing what they're getting into. Uh, there was this idea that you know, they were coming here to escape religious persecution, and they really saw this continent, if you, again, if you look at the writings and the sermons and stuff, as a kind of blank psychological slate, right? Like the idea of the continent, which of course was utterly untrue, is that it was empty. It was some kind of like Edenic place. And this is like ridiculously not true, but this is what they thought which is why they were kind of horrified when they would encounter like actual people in the woods or things that they didn't know how to control. Um, 
And this also uh, is, uh, you know, and one of the things that Slotkin argues is that they uh, projected a lot of their kind of internal repressions and fears onto this wilderness, right? Like the Pur Puritans are like, you know, famously afraid of sex and, and very repressed, right? So in a lot of ways, the, the wilderness and what they saw as this kind of animal savagery that they began to hate uh, is something that, you know, really was just something inside themselves that they couldn't face. Um, and in a lot of ways, this explains the way that a lot of white settlers have like dealt with the continent. But flash forward a few hundred years, or at least several decades, uh, and you have uh, what Slotkin uh, considers the emergence of the first American hero in American literature, which is the hybrid white hunter, right? The idea that, that a white person can go into the woods and actually learn what the Native Americans know, what the Indians know, and like learn their skills. And somehow, because, again, this is, this is white racist thinking, but like because he represents something that's more civilized, he's combining the superpower of European civilization with the kind of like animal power of the continent and emerging as a kind of like super person who combines animal power and kind of like higher intelligence. And this is essentially the, um, this hybrid hero kind of character. This is one of the earliest examples of it. Now, Daniel Boone was a real person, but after his death, he was heavily mythologized as this kind of person who was like very intellectual and a statesman, but could also like, you know, kill animals and skin them and do all this kind of stuff. He could survive. He was like the white person who had like learned how to survive in this continent. Um, and we flash forward a few decades later and we get to, of course, Theodore Roosevelt, who took this idea and kind of brought it to the level of like national consciousness. How many of you have been to the Museum of Natural History here? Right, it, this, is the, this is the Teddy Roosevelt Museum of Death, right? It's like, it, it's, it, it's, 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 ba it's basically just animals that he killed, right? And then brought them here. And you see him, so, and again, we have him as this kind of like triumphant character who is flanked by these native characters. Um, kind of drawing power from them. But of course, he's the one on top. It's kind of like he's the master of the continent um, because in his imagination, and I think also in the imagination of the culture that he's um, supporting, um, you know, he's, he, he's brought this kind of like super European-ness to this place. And one of the things that um, is interesting about uh, Teddy Roosevelt is that he, uh, you know, he was a sickly child, right? There was this idea that he um, was, you know, this idea that to become a real man, it's like you have to like eat animals when they're alive or I don't know. Like he had this whole, he had this whole like super like macho like great white hunter thing going on. Um, also really interesting side reading about this if you ever wanna, and if you're interested in the museum, uh, Don, uh, Donna Haraway's The Teddy Bear Patriarchy is a really great article about that. That's a great like feminist reading on that. Um, so, uh, now where does this leave us? This leaves us with um, a 20th century that has all these ideas kind of popping up all over the place and all these different kinds of fiction. Um, I mean, it's not just Superman and Princess of Mars. I mean, I mean, how many people know Dune, right? I mean, that's what Dune's about. Dune's basically the same, the same thing. It's funny, I was talking to somebody earlier today who was like, Paul Atreides is not actually white in that story. He's actually, so he's like, so even if it's not racial, like he's still a, he's, he's still a character from privilege. Like the fact that he's a noble person so Dune is about a character who comes from a noble family who then leaves his noble family to become the leader of a revolution against his noble family on this planet of these indigenous people called the Fremen. Um, and it's, uh, so there's a lot of, like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be racial, but that's kind of, or at least I think that the, the evidence suggests that that's kind of the core of it if you look at it historically. Um, and then if you're revising it, you, you are kind of revi revising that original kind of puritanical fear of this kind of like ra racial other. Um, but of course we see it in Avatar, right? You know, we see it in <laughs> The Last Samurai with Tom Cruise, right? You know, uh, which, is, which is funny because even though Japan is not a wilderness, uh, there is a tendency on the part of of uh, you know, Anglo-American culture to kind of see cultures it doesn't understand as you know, quote unquote savage or at least confusing. You know, he comes into this world and is like, I don't know what's going on, but apparently I'm the last samurai, so I don't know. <laughs> um, so I mean, if this is how you know, uh, America in a lot of like, ways in its popular culture and its like, mass storytelling, if this is the way it understands itself, like what happens when Vietnam happens? Right, you know, there's this whole, in the 80s, there's this whole kind of attempt to kind of like reclaim this kind of shattered masculinity of America, of the kind of like the American hero, 
uh, from this kind of trauma of like defeat in the jungles of Vietnam, which it kind of like interprets through this kind of through this lens of the kind of John Carter uh, kind of character who has to like find this wilderness kind of purity in order to survive. And um, it's interesting too because I'm a game designer and uh, it's interesting to see how in modern times video games have dealt with these characters to try to uh, address some of these concepts in a wider way. I do think that it's funny because I, I think a lot of my stuff about games is going to be critical here because I think that there's a great possibility in games for games to address these concepts in a resonant way and I think often they don't. Um, this is a game from, this is from uh, the Superman Returns video game. Um, this game was so, I think, unsuccessful, I don't even think they made a Man of Steel video game. But um, as you can see though, they're trying to deal with the idea that Superman is indestructible. So you can see that like Metropolis has a health meter and you're just kind of like, oh no, Metropolis is getting smashed up. I can't die, but I lose if Metropolis dies. So, um, so that's one way that people have tried to deal with it. Um, but it kind of, it, it kind of just, kinda, it kind of addresses his superpower is like its main point of what it's addressing. It doesn't actually get into the kind of pathos of the character that the character potentially has as an alien, for example. Or like, what does it mean to pass as human? What does it mean to have power over humans and to be human but not human at the same time? The whole idea of like being this like other hybrid. Um, Similarly, Dune, um, actually Dune, the novel and the movie, are actually responsible for an entire game genre, which is the real-time strategy game. Um, and this is another instance where they actually got a really interesting game design out of it, but they also kind of avoided all the kind of heady cultural concepts in it. I mean, I think you could have taken something that wasn't Dune and kind of got the same design out of it, but they were kind of saying, oh, it's really interesting that there's this revolution going on and there's all this complicated ecosystem, so some like, some kind of like systems nerd was like, this is gonna be a great strategy game. So they made this strategy game out of it and it's actually influenced the whole genre, which is really interesting, but it doesn't quite have some of the kind of like raw transformative uh, prickly power that the original myth does. Um, interestingly, I actually think that the game that's come closest to this has been the to Tomb Raider reboot, which just to be fair is first of all made in Canada, second of all, Lara Croft is British, not American, but there is something about her character in this story, it's about her, the previous Lara Croft games were all about her already being a badass, whereas this game is kind of like Batman Begins for her. It's like she's rich, she's pampered, she's like Teddy Roosevelt as a kid, right? And she's like, I don't know what I'm gonna do, and then she gets, gets trapped on this island. It's all about her becoming, getting the bow and arrow and learning how to survive and all this kind of stuff. It would be interesting to see what would happen if you took this kind of game, this kind of experience, and you put it in more of an American context. Um, Okay, so that's the superhero, um, which I know superhero is a broad term. In this case, I kind of mean a, an alien with superpowers who passes as human and it's kind of like has godlike powers. Um, but uh, we're gonna talk about another character who is also has been called a superhero, but for the purposes of this discussion, I'm gonna call them uh, the vigilante. So a way to kind of think about the vigilante archetype in American culture is to think about, you know, where does Batman come from? Like we asked where Superman comes from. So here's Batman's origin story. Um, what is he responding to? You know, what is this character responding to and what inspires him? I mean, th this in, in some ways, you know, I mean, everybody knows, I would assume the story of like Batman's parents being killed and he's a rich kid and his rich parents get killed and rather than going to a therapist, he's like, I have to dress up and beat up people for the rest of my life. <laughs> and uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is how Bruce Wayne deals with it, but pay attention to the marquee. And this is actually part of the DC canon in the universe. I don't think it was part of the very first instance of the character, but I do, at some point, this became important. And it is referenced uh, in a few, bat, uh, a few Batman stories that are pretty famous, including Dark Knight Returns. But the Mark of Zorro, right, is uh, the film that they're seeing the night that his parents are shot. And who is Zorro? What is Zorro all about? So, I mean, Zorro's a masked vigilante during the Mexican rule of California, also of noble birth. And it's important to point out he's actually kind of not really a Mexican hero. I mean, he's invented by this Anglo-American guy from Illinois um, in 1919, and uh, then becomes this kind of big film kind of phenomenon, television phenomenon a few decades later. Um, but it is interesting, though, that he is very much a kind of, kind of proto version of a Batman character. He is in a Wild West context, which is a world of guns, but he doesn't use a gun, he uses a sword, kind of in the same way that Batman is in an urban world of guns, but doesn't use a gun. 
Um, and the idea that he has to wear a mask and that he comes from noble birth. These are all ideas that are kind of like being reinvented in an urban context in kind of, you know, 150 years later with, uh, with Batman. Um, so here's the question, where does this idea come from? So for this, we're going to get help from a different scholar, uh, actually a film critic, Jay Hoberman, you may have heard of him. Uh, he's written quite a lot of film criticism. He wrote this amazing book called The Dream Life, which is basically about the 60s. It's about film in the 60s and how film is related to politics in the 60s. And he basically asks the question like, wow, you know, the 50s and the 70s are really different. Um, what happened? And uh, one of the things he talks about a lot in the book is the death of the Western. The 60s was the era when the Western was dying as a popular form. So, what is the Western all about? Again, we have, the, we have a character with a mask, uh, the Lone Ranger, another famous Western character that also has that kind of masked vigilante aspect to him. Um, it's important to mention here that uh, the, this is kind of related to the Daniel Boone, Teddy Roosevelt character, but uh, they gave birth to many different kind of variants of this archetype. So uh, the cowboy is related to the kind of great quote unquote, great, great white hunter character, but it's not exactly the same, although obviously they're related. Um, but the Western, interestingly, um, as, as the um, European colonizers moved west, uh, this became the main defining fictional mythology of the latter half of the 19th century when it was happening, and most importantly, the first half of the 20th century. So it really wasn't until the 70s that the Western was dead as a kind of mythological form. So the first after the West died at the end of the 19th century, the whole first half of the 20th century is all about thinking about the Western, trying to understand all of our modern conflicts through the lens of the Western. There are West, like if you look at a Western that's made during World War II, it's all about World War II. Look at one made during the Korean War, it's all about the Korean War. Made during Vietnam, it's all about, you know, so like there's a way that like America's use, the Western is kind of like the American genre, right? And from a, in a global sense, it's often the genre that the world, the rest of the world looks at America and says, oh, that's the genre that you invented. Um, so anyway, um, what's interesting about the Western is the Western is how America asks itself, what is civilization and what is justice? So we have here High Noon, which is the story where, uh, you know, one character knows what's right and has to go against everybody and, the system is broken, but one person can dispense justice. Um, on the right, we have a bit of a darker take on it, which is John Wayne and the Searchers, who is, uh, it's a later Western, and it's a Western that's beginning to, I don't know if it's quite questioning, but at least beginning to be less kind of squeaky clean about the kind of difficulties of, he's, a, he's kind of a bloodthirsty murderer in this story. And in a lot of ways, the kind of like, it, it, it's almost like uh, early Western characters are kind of like early Batman, and then like later Western characters have this more like, you know, dark post Frank Miller kind of Batman aspect to them. Um, so, uh, what else is happening in the 60s, right? So, we've got um, the Western which is dying, and as the Western dies, it's reflecting what actually happened to the West when the West died, which is that urbanization came in and took it over. The, Wilderness became the city. And the idea is that this would, fi this would fix everything somehow, and of course it did not. Um, these are pictures from uh, Italian Westerns, and one of the things, what's interesting is that this transformation of what happened to the American West, I think you can actually see a bit more clearly in Italian Westerns because they're actually standing outside the culture and looking at it. So, um, uh, yeah, so basically you've got this really clear shift that you see in the Italian Westerns and kind of looking at America and saying, oh, I think this is what's kind of happening to the Western. And um, this urbanization is taking over uh, the genre as it dies, which is, of course, what happened in real life as well. Um, so this is interesting. So you've got these transitional films in the late 70s of, um, of, the, uh, you know, of the disappearing of the West and like, what are we going to do? So what else is going on at the time? You have the left in the United States which is having this huge explosion, right? Like this is the time of the left revolution in the United States. Um, this is the free love movement, this is the anti-war movement, and this is popping up in popular culture, right, in films like Easy Rider, and many other films of the time as well. But the reason I'm mentioning this is because um, one of the interesting things that happened at the end of the 60s as well, the early 60s are defined by a lot of optimism surrounding these left-wing revolutionary ideas. And the end of the 70s is in some way, this is an oversimplification probably, but in some ways, the end of the 60s is kind of when things begin to vol vol uh, excuse me, fall apart. 
Uh, the drugs kind of begin to take over. There's this idea that uh, one of the things that this movie is 68, one of the things that this movie is about is about how these people kind of thought that they were part of this big change, but really they're like, oh, maybe we're not really doing anything. Maybe we're just drug addicts. Like, I don't know what this is really about. And um, what's interesting is that this kind, of percept, this kind of perceived failure of the left to kind of like follow through on their revolution um, gives the right the opportunity to actually like take some of that thunder, some of that rebellious thunder, and create this new archetype, which is the idea of the right-wing rebel. So before that, the idea of the rebel was not like a right-wing idea, but the, the thing that happens, especially when you have this transference of Western characters, and of course, Clint Eastwood was famous for being in Westerns, to the urban setting, is that you get this, um, you get this idea that the whole system is broken, that you know, nobody, like this kind of liberal system for actually controlling everything is actually broken and the kind of person who really understands justice and who is not gonna be bothered by red tape or you know, things like the law or due process is just gonna go kill the bad guys because that's what needs to happen. And this kind of gets, unlike the West, this now gets applied to just our modern kind of contemporary world, like modern contemporary American urban space. Um, which of course is like famous through the lens of this character Dirty Harry, which uh, Clint Eastwood played. Um, this what created this explosion of all these other kind of characters. There was, um, of course, the Death Wish movies. Also, arguably, has a relation to like the John McClane character in Die Hard, uh, who doesn't do what the cops say and just does what he also is a cowboy. They call him a cowboy in that movie. Um, you know, and, uh, like uh, the Mel Gibson's character in Lethal Weapon are all like this. But most importantly. This is the template for how Frank Miller reinvents Batman in the 80s. So Batman was a very different character all through this time that I've been talking about. I'm essentially making the argument that the Batman that we have today is really not a descendant of the Batman that was going on in the 60s and before that. It's really a descendant of this kind of like cowboy, dirty, hairy kind of archetype. Uh, because that is really the DNA that Frank Miller in the 80s brings to it when he does Dark Knight Returns. Um, and of course, this is the famous scene where he actually kills the Joker just in cold blood and it's just horrible. Uh, because that's what you know, John Wayne and the Searchers would do, that's what Dirty Harry would do, um, and it's just pretty rough and nasty. And um, of course, everybody loved it. They were like, this is amazing. So um, this is of course also the time of Watchmen, which um, is also about masked vigilante heroes. Um, and um, in a lot of ways, it's a left-wing critique, I think. If you know anything about Alan Moore and his politics, it's like a left-wing criti critique of a lot of these ideas, although a lot of its fans don't know that, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and uh, so, so, and I think that, you know, this kind of brings us up to now. I think that the real legacy of um, Batman and these, um, uh, this kind of reinvention of Batman at that time and this kind of, like, these kind of darker vigilante characters at that time are really part of this same um, kind of frustration about, like, how do we understand justice and civilization in our kind of, like, now urbanized world. Um, one of the things that I think is pretty interesting about this is that everybody loves Batman, kind of everybody loves these characters, I think because in a way it's like easier to imagine your, I mean that's kind of what Kick-Ass is about, right? It's about it, being able to imagine yourself as the superhero. Um, it's like just normal people, right? And um, that makes it very appealing and of course everybody kind of projects their own politics onto it and that's kind of one of the power, one of the powers of this kind of stuff. But what's interesting about this is that, um, you know, obviously if you're familiar with the Christopher Nolan Batman films, is that when you're, when you're dealing with a character that has this much kind of political baggage to it and this much kind of, you know, kind of like the, the rage of kind of like privileged middle class white people kind of buried in it, you know, you kind of are trying to, uh, you know, from a left wing point of view, you're kind of always kind of acting against that. You're kind of trying to explain it away or minimize it somehow, which is why you get all this bending over backwards in the Christopher Nolan movies about like, oh, Batman is like, he's a dark guy, but He's kind of, he, he'll do these awful kind of pseudo-fascist things, but then he totally is like, no, I will not become the real bad guy, right? Which is, as you, this, is this is from, uh, as, you, as you know, this is from The Dark Knight, the second film where he hacks everybody's cell phones to create all this data and essentially just, you know, is invading everybody's privacy. 
Um, and I remember when I saw that movie when it came out, uh, you know, of course, there was all this controversy about like, oh, should the government be able to look into your computer? No, you know, and all this kind of stuff. I remember when Batman at the end, uh, Fox is like, oh, but, you know, should we keep all this information? And Batman is like, no, you know, destroy it, you know, because I care about democracy, <laughs> you know. Or I will in 45 minutes after I break all these democratic rules, you know. <laughs> You know, so, and, 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 but that's the fantasy, right? The left wing, the, I think the left wing fantasy is that you can become a right wing character temporarily and then go back. You know, is that you can be like, like, yeah, so, so clearly there's no consequences to this. Incidentally, if you want to know kind of the, the kind of real consequences of this and all of its disturbing glory, read the Frank Miller comic. Um, it's pretty nasty stuff. Um, Anyway, so back to video games. Uh, everybody loves the Arkham Knight, Arkham Asylum, Arkham series, right? And it is really fun. Um, it's about uh, Batman in these interestingly confined spaces. What's fascinating about these games, and they are really wonderful at making you kind of feel awesome for being Batman. I remember like, uh, and that's why, that's why they're popular, right? Like that's why they're successful, it's because um, a lot of superhero games don't do a great, I, great job of really making you feel like that character. But this game, I remember like when this game came out, this is the, the first Batman game that just lets you hang upside down like a bat. And then you can just hang upside down and people are just like, wow, I'm Batman, you know? Like, and, then, uh, and then when somebody gets below you, you can just snatch them up and then they scream and get really scared. And then people are just like, wow, this is amazing, you know? So there's something about the key uh, inflection points of what it means to be Batman that this is hitting that was, like really touched exactly the power fantasy of being Batman that everybody really loved. Also, they're very well made. Production value is extraordinarily high. They're very well done, right? So that's why it's good. But interestingly, they can't deal with, or they don't deal with any of the real moral questions or difficult ideas of the character, I think because they always put you in these settings where you're not interacting with society at large. It's interesting that Arkham Asylum is set in Arkham Asylum, right? You're never, there are no civilians anywhere in any of these games. Interestingly, when they made the second game, which is called Arkham City, it's like, ooh, now I get to be in the city. Now I get to be Batman running around just in Gotham. You know, that's gonna be awesome. Oh, what, what would happen if I found somebody and I didn't know if they were a criminal? Like, would I have to like find out? Like, that might get messy. No, because uh, everyone's a criminal in Gotham City. And um, I mean, they explain it by kind of giving you this weird escape from New York excuse. It's kind of like, oh, uh, well, Arkham Asylum got too crowded, so there was a section of the city that we were gonna demolish, and we decided to get, build a gate around it, and now it's kind of like a city, but there's only criminals in it. So you can kind of run around a city, but you can feel good about punching anybody because they're all criminals, right? <laughs> so clearly Batman doesn't have to deal with any of the troubling ideas that go back to the Western or the vigilante, right? Uh, because we know everyone's bad. Um, and that's an interesting question about video games. Like uh, some people actually argue in video games, well, because video games are about being fun, you can't deal with those things. Because if you started to deal with them, they would become uninteresting. This is of course nonsense, um, but this is what a lot of people believe. Uh, so it's interesting to think about what it would mean to create a game like this where you did have moral choices where Batman, like what if I accidentally beat up like a homeless person and I broke his neck and then I was like, oh my God, you know, like do I turn myself in? You know, do I say, do I go on television and say, I'm Bruce Wayne, I, I, I'm sorry, I did this, you know. Uh, but that would be amazing and you can't do that in this game. Um, similar with games like Red Dead Redemption, which actually are based on the Western, right? Um, these are games that kind of pay a lot of lip service to the moral grayness of the genre, but they don't actually follow through on it in the gameplay. Now, speaking as a game designer, one of the ways you can tell whether a game is really about the ideas it claims to be about is if they are verbs in the game, and they are things you do in the game, and they are choices you are given in the game. This game is hardcore into telling you, oh, this is all about this guy who wants to go straight, he doesn't want to be a criminal, he's all conflicted. Well, he's not conflicted after I killed 400 people on that last mission, <laughs> you know? But he'll be like, oh, I don't want to kill people. And then a cutscene happens, or well, he'll say in a mission, oh, I really don't want to kill people, I feel so bad. And it's like really well done, really good production value, writing's good, acting's good. 
And then, you know, you kill 400 people, and then when the mission's over, he's like, ah, oh, I really don't want to kill people. So it's just, I mean, it's ridiculous, right? It's, it creates a kind of narrative dissonance that a lot of these games, I think, can't really recover from, or they can't really address these ideas. They kind of have to, like, wink and look the other way. And it's a real problem. And people in games will tell you that it's because games can't do this, and that's not the case. It's because marketers won't let them do it, or they're afraid to step out of that boundary of wish fulfillment, of violent wish fulfillment. And there are games that have moral choices, and there are you know, games like Bioshock, games like uh, Mass Effect. Uh, there's lots of games that do it, but uh, the Batman game doesn't do it. It's interesting. Uh, this game doesn't do it either. Okay, so um, I call this one um, from Ray to Ray, from, from, <laughs> from, from, oh yeah, I had to have at least one bad joke, so there we go. Um, but, uh, so it's interesting, this is actually about, it's about the final girl archetype, but it's, it's kind of about more than that because uh, I kind of wanted to use the final girl as a way to talk about kind of um, women in fiction in general. Um, but we're gonna talk about the, the final girl uh, mainly here. So um, anyway, um, in a way this, is, this, this, is, this section is about like what does it mean, you know, uh, how do we, how do we, how do we arrive at this cultural moment where we have a character like Rey in The Force Awakens who just saves herself? Um, obviously that's an awesome thing that should be happening, um, but it's interesting because that was not happening not too long ago. Um, so where does a character like that come from and how do we get to her from these earlier representations that we see in films like King Kong where you have this like, very obvious you know, damsel in distress kind of figure? Um, the final girl, incidentally, for those of you who don't know, is uh, the idea, it comes from horror. It's the idea of the woman who is perceptive, who is resourceful, who all of her friends die, but she lives. Uh, and she normally would be captured or killed, but she fights back and wins, usually. Or at least she's the last person standing. Um, so that's not like a uniquely American concept, but it is interesting because we can, going back to Slotkin, we can take it back to the idea of captivity narratives. This is one of the biggest things that was, this is basically just like the, the pulp story that you would read, right, like at the time of the Puritans. It was like, oh no, the, the women are going into the woods and not coming back, you know, and, and like, you know, and, and then, and, then uh, and what is happening? You know, do they want to go out there? That would be even worse, you know, so. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of anxiety around that, and, um, and you get, it, you see it kind of proliferated through these different genres, um, this is also from The Searchers. This is what John Wayne is so angry about in The Searchers, the idea that um, this, uh, I think it's his niece, I can't remember, but it's like, uh, you know, this young woman in his family has been stolen as a kid and she grows up as an Indian. And this is like, and at the end it's like, he's like, I'm gonna kill her, I'm gonna kill her. Like he'd rather kill her than actually like, you know, have her be raised as an Indian. So the idea that, um, uh, you know, that there's like, that this is the most horrible thing possible that women are actually, this thing that the men in Puritan fiction and in reality were so afraid of um, is something, you know, trying to save women from that is uh, one of the main preoccupations of this kind of like masculine heroic mindset. Um, interestingly too, um, the worst of all things that could happen um, is of course women not even preferring the company of uh, Indians or Native Americans to white settlers, but actually just wanting to go out in the woods to be by themselves and just be with other women or just be awesome, you know? And uh, for those of you who have not seen this movie, The Witch, check it out, it is like super great. Um, and also, just to mention, you know, obviously witches are not like a uniquely American concept. They're very, all these things I've just said about, uh, you know, this kind of like uh, masculine insecurity and possessiveness, this totally like exists in other cultures and goes back to witches in Europe, so it's not like unique to America. But the reason why uh, women leave and the reason why the men are afraid is, uh, is different. It has this American flavor to it, so. Um, anyway, so uh, we find these kind of like representations of threatened women all the way up through the birth of cinema. Um, obviously we find them, um, you know, after second wave feminism, you know, they kind of get a revision and I think that Princess Leia is kind of like a transitional figure when it comes to this. Um, that, you know, she, she's still kind of like trapped but at the same time she gets to fight and Carrie Fisher kind of really helps this too with her attitude, I think, you know? She, she's almost like put in this sexist mode, but you can really see her kind of fuming, like, oh, this is bullshit, you know? <laughs> and, uh, 
and uh, and it's and it's interesting because it's it's almost like she is a character who's a a character and an actress who's kind of like who's kind of like struggling within this genre mode that is within this kind of archetypal mode that is like just barely ready to kind of collapse but is not really collapsing yet. Um, and where it really becomes to break apart is in horror, is in horror films, uh, specifically horror films in the 80s. This is a book by Carol Clover, which is a really wonderful book. It's like a feminist um, analysis of like 80s horror films. And um, she is the one who coined the term final girl. And uh, she wrote about it and did this really extensive study about it. And the very you know, simple breakdown of it is that you know, the women who would normally be killed in a horror movie eventually fight back. And this is, of course, um, Jamie Lee Curtis and, um, and her mother, whose name I'm forgetting? Janet, Janet, Janet Lee. Lee, yes, okay. Janet Lee and Jamie Lee Curtis. Um, Janet Lee, of course, is in Psycho, she dies, and then uh, Jamie Lee Curtis is in Halloween, um, kind of 20, about, well, no, 18 years later, probably, and, uh, and she lives, she fights back. And Jamie Lee Curtis is widely considered the first final girl, right? And uh, those of you, in, I mean, if you Google final girl, this is what you get, right? Like you get these like obvious representations of these women who are in these like 80s, they call them the slasher subgenre, like it's not just horror, but it's like these, the genre where like men, always men, uh, stalk and kill women, and then one woman fights back and kills this kind of like, kind of like distorted, ugly, horrible, masculine character. And um, uh, it's Nightmare on Elm Street in the middle, and of course Scream, and everybody who's seen Scream, Scream was kind of like a famous kind of deconstruction of this. Uh, and, you know, now there's a movie called Final Girl. Uh, and uh, this came out, uh, this came out last year, and um, I actually haven't seen it, but I've read a synopsis of it, and it actually does kind of make references to the kind of Janet Lee, Jamie Lee Curtis relationship. Uh, so it's very interesting. I mean, I think that this is an idea that came in the 80s, and actually, pa similar to Campbell's idea of the monomyth, pa actually passed over from academia into the mainstream. Um, so it's very interesting. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened in the 80s, as the 80s went onward, is you see these kind of like variants of the final girl, right? Like the kind of pure final girl is in very much in like the slasher film, right? Which is like Halloween, Friday the 13th, um, Nightmare on Elm Street, like obviously the Scream films, which are like a revival of that genre in the late 90s. But um, obviously it, it relates to all these other genres too, usually horror. I mean, Ripley and Alien has been talked about as also a final girl. Um, and also in Aliens, it's interesting because it, there's something very interesting uh, about Aliens where she's in this situation as, uh, you know, she's like the final girl again and there's all these other people who, you know, don't believe her. So, um, but it, what you see, I think, specifically in Ripley is not just a character who fights back, but a character who actually becomes a warrior. So there's this, there's this transition from a final girl just defending herself to actually becoming an active warrior. And in the 90s, obviously we get this in Buffy, and um, it's interesting because the Buffy, you know, Buffy is using horror as kind of a template for this kind of stuff, but it's actually not bound by horror because we begin to see the horror genre expand here and become more like, uh, you know, more like adventure. Like Buffy is in some ways is more like a Campbell, uh, Campbellian monomyth kind of character um, who goes on this kind of like long, kind of transformative, transcendental uh, hero's journey throughout the many seasons of the show. Uh, but it does kind of begin with her kind of coded as a kind of final girlish character. Um, and then I think today what we've got is, uh, I think we're living in this kind of golden age of this like post final girl development, which is really awesome. You know, you've got Jessica Jones, which is a really cool show. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, you know, the new Mad Max movie was really fantastic for this. Yes, it's technically Australian. It's not American. Um, but it was very popular here and people really liked it. And it does resonate, I think. Um, but I mean, obviously the most, you know, the most obvious example is like this moment from The Force Awakens, which is like, I don't know how like more symbolic you can get, you know, in terms of, I mean, if, it's, it's like literally Star Wars chooses her, you know? Like there's this moment where like bo her and the dude are reaching for the lightsaber and the lightsaber's like, no, not the dude, her, you know? <laughs> you know? And, uh, and it's, this, it's this fantastic, I think very self-aware, but not too self-aware kind of moment. And, um, you know, I do think that, 
again, I don't want to say like, oh, it, you know, yay, feminism won, everything's done. You know, I'm not saying that, but um, I do think that um, in, in some ways, you know, it feels like there's like an acceleration happening, like with this revision uh, right now. And so, and I, I wouldn't call Ray a final girl, but I think that the final girl is this quintessentially American archetype who, in a way, if you think of like, you know, the superhero as like a wild, coming from the wilderness, the vigilante is coming from the city, and then, interestingly, final girl coming from the suburbs. You see this kind of like development of this, you know, American character. Like, where is the danger? It was in the wilderness. Oh my God, we built cities. Okay, now everything's fine. Oh my God, oh my God, no, the cities aren't safe. Let's build the suburbs. Oh my God, there's a knife killer, you know. <laughs> you know, and then, uh, so yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, it's kind of like, you're never safe. I mean, where is it going to be next? This is really interesting. Well, I, well actually, no, 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 it's clearly online. So, okay, I, duh, what am I thinking of? I mean, uh, so, uh, so there you go. Um, but yeah, so I think that, um, and again, Ray's not a final girl, um, really, but there is something of the final girl DNA. The, the, the final girl, I think, is kind of like the adrenaline shot in some ways that kind of like helped push a lot of this stuff forward. Um, anyway, uh, again, video games are not awesome at this. Um, I think that there is a problem of uh, women protagonists in video games, so this is, this is a, a problem within a problem. Um, interestingly, uh, there are games where you do play a final girl, and these are two of them, but they're not American, they're Japanese. Um, and they're very interesting, uh, but they're also kind of like, it's kind of like this third removed cultural variant of the Final Girl idea because the Final Girl films like Halloween um, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre and some of these other ones uh, helped inspire uh, Italian, similar, like Italians love copying American stuff and making it weird and interesting. So, um, so like it happened with the Western, it also happened with horror, right? So Dario Argento made Suspiria and these other films, which are actually the inspiration for these Japanese games which are, in which you unambiguously play a Final Girl. Um, and these are actually very interesting games because the way that you have to manage, um, you know, you're, you're definitely fighting somebody who's stronger than you and it's about being intelligent and trying to get away from them. Um, and those are from the 90s. But of course, like, I think we're seeing a bit more of this now. Like this game is uh, Until Dawn, right? Which is a game where you get to play, in some ways it's almost like you're like a horror movie director and you get to kind of play all these different scenarios with these different characters and see how it all works out. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention from video games too is Alien Isolation is a recent game that came out where you play like Rip Ripley's daughter from Alien uh, and you're kind of uh, running away from the creature. Uh, and it, it's cool, it's very much, also very much kind of like a final girl in that kind of science fiction alien mode kind of game. Um, but what's interesting about it is that uh, it, that game took like 15 years to be made. Basically, nobody believed anybody would want to play a game where you were just this woman running around, running away from the alien or trying to outsmart it. Everybody was like, no, space marines. No, every, no, people only want space marines. And in, in, in some ways, everybody has missed the point of that movie, Aliens, right? Like everybody, like that movie, like Ripley's the, the, the main character and the, the marines are stupid, they're wrong, you know? Like they don't make smart choices and they all get themselves killed. All, like most Aliens video games up until this point, they're like made by the Bill Paxton character in that movie. You know, they're like, this is gonna be awesome, you know? And it's like, it's not awesome, it's actually horrible, right? And, so I think that there was an Aliens game, there was a game called Aliens Colonial Marines, which actually just, it, it, um, it was in development for I think like six or seven years and it came out and it was just terrible. And because that was such a disaster, they finally gave a green light to this game. But they ha actually, that game had to tank in order for some executive to be, oh, okay, fine, you know, make the game where the woman is the hero because that actually is what made the movies great, but you know, never mind, you know. But uh, so, yeah, so it's interesting how this thinking gets so turned around. Also, I wanted to mention, too, that uh, Samus Aran from Metroid um, is inspired by Ripley. Uh, and uh, Metroid originally, if you've uh, heard the original creator of it talk, he's mentioned uh, Alien as one of the main inspirations uh, for that character. So she's kind of a famous character who has had some problematic representation, but I think that in a lot of ways she's been reclaimed by, there's definitely kind of like a feminist project to kind of re reclaim that character and make her awesome. So um, anyway, so that's basically it. Uh, I want to leave, we're not going to talk about the team. Uh, so, you know, DLC to be continued. Um, so anyway, 
So I think that when we want to understand why story, you know, like where do stories come from, right? I mean, they come from our environment, they come from our history, they come from our culture, and they come from everything that is around us, things that we know, things that are subconscious, and it helps, you know, we, we don't want to be overly aware of these things, right? Like it's not, if you're writing an academic paper, you want to be aware of them, but as a creator, you know, you don't want to totally be aware of them, but I think that if you do have that, like, no, I just want to be original, don't make me think about anything, oh, you know, that's, I don't want to be influenced, right? Like, that's what creativity is, right? I think that you're doing it, you're shooting yourself in the foot. I think that the media creates this idea of creativity as being this thing that makes something appear from nothing, right? That it makes, it, it doesn't need any raw material, right? Creativity needs raw material to create, and uh, it needs fuel, in other words. Um, and, but, you know, and this is a big cultural misconception, right, that artists just create stuff out of nowhere. They don't create it out of nowhere. They create it out of all the nuance and specificity of our everyday lives. And one thing that I want to end with is that I've talked about a lot of, obviously, like, troubling topics in this, in this talk, mainly just because I think if you're going to talk about the world that your stories come from and the history surrounding it, uh, you're going to have to deal with, like, the real history of the place that you're in, right, of the culture that you're in, your culture's history. And it's important to not run away from that stuff, but to also understand that this is stuff that you can transform, right? Like you can't choose what culture you're born into, and you can't choose what kind of psychological baggage you're saddled with, but you can choose how you try to transform that and play with these symbols. And of course, there's bad ways to do that. I'm, I mean, this is, it, it can be terrible, but, um, you know, it's something that, um, we all get to try, and the more you learn about other people's experiences and see where your experiences stop and other people's begin, the better perspective you have, and I think that enriches all of us as storytellers. So, that's it. What do you think of the American archetype uh, of the underdog and how that relates to... Oh, the underdog? Well, it's interesting because I think that yeah, and I, yeah, I mean, I think I want to stress, too, that, like, I mean, these are not the only ones, right? Like, these are just, like, I, I, I happen to have read some books that articulate these particular ones, right? So, I mean, this is not, like, these are the ones, right? So, yeah, no, I, the underdog is an interesting, is, it's a character, it's a kind of character that we talk about a lot. I guess my first question would be, is it American? Maybe it is. Um, it, uh, I mean, it's certainly part of the whole mythology that the country and the culture has of, coming from nothing, as it were, you know what I mean? Being weak, um, perceiving yourself to be, I mean, maybe it goes back to the Puritan idea, right? Of like, uh, the Puritans are the underdogs, perceive themselves to be the underdogs because they're kind of these, you know, weak Europeans kind of against this wilderness that they're not accustomed to. Um, and it's interesting to think when we, when we think about abuses of power, you know, I mean, and we see this in, you know, when people are being killed in the street today, that you know, the people who are doing killing are, are people who imagine themselves to be the underdog, right? You know, they're just like, they, it's somebody, oh God, what is it? So I didn't mention this in the talk, but Alan Moore, so who did Watchmen and all these things, man, that guy hates superheroes. Like he has, he has done this whole 180 where he's just like, you know what? None of you guys understood what I did in the 80s. You all think this is awesome. Oh my God, I'm horrified. You know, like this is like Rorschach is not awesome. Excuse me. You know, uh, that was not what I was trying to say. And um, so I think that, I think that he has said some pretty harsh things about the superhero archetype and what he thinks it means for, like what he thinks it says about America. And I think, so, and I'm paraphrasing. I would encourage you to like look up the actual quote, but. What I remember him saying is that, is that Americans hate the idea of a fair fight. You know what I mean? Which in a lot of ways is where it explains like the superhero, right? You know, because um, it's like you're not evenly matched with your opponent. I mean, unless your opponent is another superhero, which is often the case. But I think that in the case of Batman, like those criminals are like made of paper. You know, like you're like snapping bones and I mean, he's a hulking dude, you know? He's like this bodybuilder who has like all the money in the world to like pump steroids into him and make his brain smart with brain drugs, like whatever. And like whatever he is, he's like, every, all this stuff is, 
has, has, has made him into this like super character, all to defend against this like weak drug addict who he's like, like curb stomping, you know? And, and I think, you know, and when, you know, and I'm not anti-cop and I think there's lots of good cops, but when cops do stuff like that, you know, I mean, arguably there's possibly a similar psychology going on there, right? Everybody perceives themselves to be acting in defense and especially the strongest people who are the most bullying and the most awful and destructive have that, they have that um, illusion the strongest. You know, it's like I was defending myself against this person who obviously posed no threat to me at all. So, anyway. So when you approach game narrative writing, how do, you, how do you keep theme and character consistent when the player has choices to make that could alter that? Um, I think that, uh, well, I think it's just about understanding what the limits of the player choices are and not, you know, just planning for it. A lot of people don't plan for it. And a lot of people don't, a lot of people just don't bother to do the work to reconcile the, the behavior that the game system promotes and the actual story they're telling. A lot of them are like, it's fun to shoot people, so this is a game, Red Dead Redemption, it's fun to shoot people, so this is a game about shooting people. Oh, but people like narratives of redemption, so this is about redemption. If it's about shooting people, it's not about redemption. You know what I mean? And it's kind of like, and I think that um, there is a tendency to just ignore the problem or to say it's too hard or, or whatever. Um, I just think people don't do the work. I think people, I think that any problem like that is actually solvable if you, if you actually do the work. And you can see it in games that, that actually do the work. I mean, I think that there are, um, like I said, that there, there are games where, um, you know, like the Mass Effect games where you're given moral choices and you can't randomly just go around shooting everybody in that game. The game doesn't let you do that. But you also understand that you're not supposed to do that, right? That like Shepard, Commander Shepard wouldn't do that. So when I press a button, the button that normally pulls out my gun and shoots, and that button doesn't work without explanation when I'm standing in front of an innocent person, if you present it the right way, that doesn't feel like a broken game. That feels like characterization, right? That feels like, well, you, that button doesn't appear here because the character wouldn't do that. Um, but it's all about framing. It's all, it's all about how, I, I think that that coming off as feeling like character or it coming off as feeling like a broken system or a confusing system is, I think the f that's a very tough needle to thread and it requires teams to be coordinated in ways that they often are not in game development. Like the programmers, the artists, the writers, the producers, everyone all has to be functioning as a well-oiled machine. It can't just be like, design the gameplay, then we'll write something. You know, like, it, that can't be your system if you want that level of coherence in your game design. And slowly it's changing. Um, narrative design is the art of getting that system, that system in your production actually designed properly so you can achieve stuff like that. I think it's, it's funny, I think it's a production problem. I think it's a production problem and I think it's a literacy problem. I think a lot of people don't know it's possible because they have too many bad examples. And people who don't want to try point to those bad examples as if, as if that is just the state of technology, right? And it's not. It's, it's, it's a design problem that is solvable and you just have to put the effort into solving it. What is your opinion of the good and bad endings being, I mean, it's just like, it's just good or bad. Like, there's no in between. Well, um, again, I think it depends on the game. I think it depends on the story. Um, I think, um, I mean, like, well, yeah, it depends on the game. So often it can seem like a reduction because if you have a lot of subtlety in the game and then suddenly, you know, it's like, uh, it's like, oh, I kicked, three dogs in the game, but I was nice to nine old ladies. And because I kicked three dogs, um, I shot my brother in the head in the ending, you know, because I'm bad, you know? And it's like, okay, that's weird, right? Like, so I think that, but sometimes you get into this weird math like that where it's just awkward and it doesn't really work. Um, 
So I think that, and again, I mean, I, I guess my answer for this is kind of the same as the answer for the previous question. It's just like, if you care about that making sense, then you'll put the work into making sure it makes sense. And that has to be something that you consider at every phase of your design. It can't be an afterthought. If it's an afterthought, you'll find yourself in a situation where the writer can't write it in time, or you can't do it in time, or you can't redesign the system in time, or you can't, oh, oh oops, these, th these, these dots I wanted to connect actually don't match. It's like I'm building a bridge from two sides, and oh, oops, it actually looks like that. What do I do? I build the ladder, you know? So, and it's ugly, you know? Uh, that's kind of what, I think that happens in a lot of games where it feels awkward like that. And again, I think some people try really hard and because they haven't designed their process right or because of like meddling from producers or marketers or whatever, it can end up badly, so it's not necessarily their fault. Or it's people who just don't care or one person on the team doesn't care and they ruin it for everybody. You know, I mean, there's all the different variants of like how these things can go wrong. Um, I think that there are, in the, the idea of binary endings is interesting though because I think it can be done well. Um, the very first Legacy of Kane game I think actually did something pretty interesting. It had one choice at the very end, and you only got to make it one, you only got to make this one choice, and then you, you chose whether you got a good or bad ending at the end. And the thing I liked about it is rather than give you all these choices during the course of the game that then kind of locked you into a particular view, really what it did is it gave you no choices in the game. So you're a vampire in the game, and you kind of, you don't know, the game is being narrated from the future, it's being narrated in past tense, and you don't know where it's being narrated from. Is it being narrated from this future where he dies, or is it being narrated from a future where he fully embraces his vampiric side and becomes like truly evil? And the game kind of, in, in, in the way that interesting writing does in a linear story, foreshadows both of those things kind of ambiguously, right? I mean, it's like David Lynch, right? It's, it, it has that kind of ambiguity to it. Um, and then in the ending, it's like the lady or the tiger. You're just kind of asked to choose which you believe it actually is. And I think which one feels more right kind of depends on how you read the character. Um, I like that approach. Not a lot of people do that. And obviously it wouldn't work for every game. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. I think by just being stuck with things that are binary is sometimes a frustrating design problem. And it can work out, I mean, again, I think if you put your resources into solving that design problem elegantly, then you can solve it elegantly, and if you don't put those resources in, then you will be building that ladder and apologizing to people, so. So a lot of the archetypes that you uh, talked about um, really focus on this kind of idea of power, and power fantasy in a certain extent, right? Um, and even like go, going further back, those puritanical models were again to give readers this sense that there is some level of control. Um, my question is that like you know, video games really fill that role often. Um, do you feel that because of that, um, narrative now has kind of this golden age where it can kind of expand away from those models of power that they've kind of continuously followed? Are you yeah. saying so? What exactly are you saying? So are you asking that do video games make it? easier for us to escape some of these limited ways of understanding people or? Well, no, specifically like this idea that, you know, these video games are filling this role of the power fantasy of the, the, <coughs> the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And because of that, it filling that popular idea that other forms of storytelling and even video games to a certain extent are kind of in this golden age where the, that model is kind of being left behind in a way. Wh which model? The, the, the power fantasy model. Oh, well, I think the, I mean, uh, I don't, I'm not sure how to answer that. I think that the, I don't, I wouldn't say power fantasies are being left behind. I mean, I think they're too big a part of the culture. I think that, um, I think there's a question of like where you locate your power, right? And I think that, I mean, you can be a total pacifist and be like, any kind of violence is bad, right? I mean, there are people who, who, who don't think that Furiosa and Fury Road is feminist, right? Because, because she hurts people and hurting people is masculine, you know, fundamentally. So, I mean, different people have different ideas about that. I'm not saying it's one or the other, but, uh, um, but there's different ways to look at it, right? Like you can be like a hardcore pacifist about it. Um, I do think that power isn't necessarily bad, right? I, I think that it, it depends on the context, right? I, I do think that there's a cultural hunger at this moment to like explore this stuff a bit more and a bit, you know, because I think that 
even morality aside, I think people are just like bored, right, with just like the same stuff, right? So there's, I think there's a bit of a willingness to try to explore these things in popular culture. But I think that um, what's kind of interesting that's going on in games right now is I think games are kind of having this fight where um, they're so invested in the kind of power, historically, and historically meaning the last 20 years, um, they're, they're so invested in the power fantasy narrative. I mean, in other media, it's not like other media aren't, but games kind of especially are, um, that I think that um, the way that, I think the, the fight to kind of like decouple that narrative from games or decouple it as, or separate it, or, or begin to see it as something that's not fundamental to the idea, um, as um, I think that's a, that's a hard fight in some ways. I think the resistance to that is unfortunately maybe stronger than in other cultures. Um, one thing I will say though is that when people say games are about power, they're wrong. Games are about agency, right? You know, an agency doesn't have to take the form of like stabbing somebody. It just means being able to exert some kind of will over the situation you're in. Um, whether that can be a conversation. Right? I'm just amazed that there aren't more games. I mean, like in Japan, they have all these amazing genres they don't have here. Like they have dating games and they have all this like stuff and like, it's like, oh my God, you know? It's like, what is wrong with people? It's like, just bring that stuff over, you know? I mean, they are now, they are doing more of this now, but it's funny. One of the things that I say in one of my workshops is when I talk about James Bond is that, not that James Bond is not like some amazing, you know, character in fiction, but it's just amazing to me that all the video games that involve the character don't have seduction. It's like, it's like, how is that not a game mechanic? You know, that, I mean, it's, it, it, it's like, it is, it is in Mass Effect. You know, it is in a lot of games. I would just love a James Bond game where you, the world blew up because you like failed to be a gentleman. Like that would be, you know, you know but uh, that would be amazing, right? You know, and it would, and you know, and you know, and you can do, I mean, of course there should be versions of it where you're playing as the, the woman and seducing the man. I mean, I think there's all sorts of things you can do, right? So I think, I don't know. I mean, it's a very fraught thing in games in particular. Um, and um, I think it's changing. I think it's going to change. And I think it, um, I think, I mean, I th in a way, I think the future looks good, but I think we're just kind of living through some growing pains. So. Oh, sorry, uh, the microphone is there, but then we can, yeah, then we can move it over here. Okay, yeah. Um, in the beginning, you talked briefly about the classic model of fantasy and the way that characters live um, for journey, and yep. then after adventure, they go back home. Yep. Um, how would you relate that uh, model to the examples you discussed? The what? The, the uh, examples you discussed here, how would you relate uh, that model? How, how would I? How relate. Relate. How would you the, apply those um, that model to the examples you discussed here? Oh. They, oh, I see. You mean like how do some of the archetypes that I mentioned, the American archetypes, how do they fit the hero's journey? Uh, yes. Oh. Uh, that's a good question. Um, huh. I'm trying to think of like what's the most American one. Um, that also fits the hero's journey. I'm trying to think. I mean, I, I mean, there are certain aspects of the way that, I mean, not all of them follow like, I mean, if, if we sat down and like looked through the details, we could probably find some that follow, that hit like every point and they're like a to total classic hero's journey fits everything, you know? Um, but there, there are certain, there are certain parts of the archetype that do crop up in different characters, right? Like, like, um, you know, like, like the guy who, who gives Batman all of his gadgets, um, Morgan Freeman, because I know the movies better than the comics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lu what's his name? Fox. Fox. Lucius, Lucius Fox. Um, but he, uh, so yeah, I mean, you can see him as like, oh, no, well, no, he's not the mentor character. The, um, the first movie was about uh, Ra's al Ghul. Be, uh, as the kind of, the, the, in a way, the Batman Begins is about what happens when, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi trains you, but then he, it turns out Obi-Wan Kenobi is actually Darth Vader in disguise. Um, and then you're like, oh no, now I have to kill my mentor, you know? And then, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things you see a lot, one of the things you see very seldomly, I think, is like a total pure version of it that is just kind of followed perfectly. I mean, I, I think like the Harry Potter, Star Wars, The Matrix, 
you know, those are the ones that I think are kind of like the most obvious ones because they, they kind of hit the whole wheel, right? But I think that um, you see parts of it. You, you, see, you see other mythologies and other stories cherry pick parts of it, right? You see like, and you see interesting twists on it. Like I actually hadn't thought about that until this moment, like the idea of like in Batman Begins that it's kind of like he goes on this journey to learn all this stuff and he finds his mentor and then he has to kill his mentor, right? Which is, it, it, Star Wars would have been very different, right? If that is actually how it happened. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think we could sit down and like think about this a lot and find a lot of interesting examples. But yeah, it's really, it's a template to be used however any storyteller sees fit. And in fact, it, it, it kind of becomes more interesting the more you mess with it, right? You're like, ooh, what if I combine these two characters? Right? What if I what if I took what if I took the, the you know the, the mentor and the um, the kind of like ultimate evil character and kind of combined them, right? Or what if I what if I made them the what if I combined them with the hero like the hero has a split personality or something like that? I mean you can do endless kind of variations on these ideas that way. So anyway, no, it's it's fun. It's it's part of it's part of the mix and match of the whole thing. Maybe two more. What did? One more. One question here. Sure. Sorry. Yes. So the. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so the. So I'm really glad you ended on that point there about this idea of combining characters because one of the things I think is really interesting with computer games is um, you're combining yourself with another character within the game and the clearest time I've ever seen this happen was um, the original uh, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic game. Um, there was a really good um, article written by somebody who had decided to write what it was like to be the most evil character in that game they could possibly be. Okay. And it starts out with them being like, this is really fun, I get to do whatever I want. And by the end of the game, they're like, this is not me, I feel bad about what I'm doing. And it was like this really sort of strong revelation about how his character related to this experience he was trying to um, portray in the game. And I think what was interesting about that was that if that character had just been evil and he had no agency in it, he would have played that game without having any qualms. And I'm guessing, I guess I'm, what I'm curious about and what I'm interested in asking about is how do you combine a person's own agency with a character to maybe put them in situations where they do feel uncomfortable and learn something about themselves? I mean, I think for me, uh, that, that area between, um, that kind of uh, ambiguous middle ground between what the player wants and what the character wants, the character as written, I mean, it's, it's very complicated because I think a lot of people will tell you different things about it, right? Because everybody imagines a different kind of game. Like, my relationship with my character in a game can be anything but from they make all the choices for me and they are a written character and I don't really have any control over them to they don't say anything and I do everything, right? Like, so there's a whole spectrum. I think you're talking about something where, I mean, it gets interesting when you're kind of in the middle, right? And there's some things your character do and there's some things you do, and it's like, how much of it is them? How much of it is me? How much ownership do I really feel? Again, I mean, I guess my, my answer, kind of like before, is that I think that that can be designed intelligently, where there's a very strong metaphor or a very strong understanding of why I control certain actions and why the other person controls other actions. And that can put me in uncomfortable situations on purpose. Like, um, one, of the things I, one of the things I like in the Metal Gear series is that, um, there's a lot of talking in that game, and you know, so in a way, I'm not that character. I'm not the special forces guy, but I feel like I'm his job. You know what I mean? Like I make all the decisions that have to do with his job, and he makes all the decisions that have to do with how he feels about the decisions I make <laughs> for him. It's like it's like you know when soldiers say like it's like the, the you don't think about it because your reflexes react, right? It's like I'm the reflexes, right? Like I'm the person actually doing those things. So um, it's interesting that sometimes those characters act astonished. You know, like if you punch somebody in the face, you're like, why'd you punch me in the face? Like, I don't know, I felt like it, you know? And, and uh, I mean, not every game does that, but there are some games that play with that boundary in, in interesting ways. My favorite one is uh, this game, Deadly Premonition, which is like a, again, it's a Japanese game. It's kind of an open world simulation of Twin Peaks. Imagine an anime, imagine an anime version of Twin Peaks, and that's exactly what this is. Um, but the way it works is that um, your main character, who's like this FBI agent, who's basically Kyle MacLachlan from Twin Peaks, he has a split personality called Zack, and he's always talking to him, and he's like, 
And you're like, who is this person he's always talking to? And you realize he's talking to you. You're his other personality. And you're the personality that's good at driving and shooting, and he's the personality that's good at talking. So, when you wa so you walk around the game world, but then when you walk near a character and you press the button to activate the cutscene, he's like, he's like, don't worry about it, Zach. I know you don't like talking to people. I'll handle this. You know? And then a cutscene happens and he talks to them. And it's very, it's, it's, it's very cute, right, the way that game does it, and it's kind of humorous and kind of meta. Uh, and obviously not every game can do that, but my point is that every game needs to find its solution for that dissonance problem, and it can be complicated, it can be simple, it can be jokey, it can be serious, it, you know what I mean? I mean, I think that, again, it's, 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 about, the, it's about the design planning you, you put into it. Um, I think some things are harder to do than others, but at the same time, I, I do think that because games are technology oriented and because we focus so much on the technology, we tend to not think about it as design. You know, we think about it as like, oh, the technology can do this. It's like, no, no designers do this. You know, like programmers do this. The technology doesn't actually do anything on its own. Um, but so much of the excuses and reasons are kind of offloaded onto the technology. I, I just think it's a matter of, I think it's a, everything is a design. I'm a designer, so for me, everything is a design problem, right? Um, anyway. Which brings me to my question, which is, you mentioned at the beginning a project uh, that was in development with you. Could you tell us anything about that? Oh, um, I don't know if I can. Uh, it's a, uh, so we're working on a, um, it's interesting because it, it actually does involve mythology and, and uh, uh, history in uh, uh, certain ways. Um, so yeah, it is a, a uh, I'll say that it's a, uh, it's a first person mystery game. Uh, adventure mystery game. It's not about shooting, uh, but it is about exploring, and uh, you're exploring a, uh, you're exploring the history of uh, the tech culture uh, surrounding uh, MIT and some of its dark secrets. So I love it already. I can't wait. <laughs> Thank uh, you. So. Thanks a lot. Thank you.